this has to be the most fucked up situation someone could be in, right? Shin Megami Tensei F released on the Super Famicom on October 28, 1994. This game has you playing as a high school student who has to stop this kid named Hazuma who attempted to summon demons but instead submerged the whole school into the expanse. And I'm getting some major Nakajima vibes from this so I do not know if I should be afraid or not. Now if you watched the last video then you might have noticed that this game came out the same year as SMT2. More specifically, it came out 7 months after its release. And interesting enough though, this game was made as a spin-off of the franchise, yet it's somehow considered to be mainline. Now why is this considered mainline when it was made as a spin-off? I... I actually don't know besides the fact that it said it on the official website. Compared to the last two games, if takes place within a single setting and it's just due to Kozi Okada feeling as if he reached the limit on what he could do for large scale worlds. As such, we have a game that is more self contained with the setting being a school, which you know makes sense cause school is literal hell. Now what's noteworthy about this game is that it will lead to the creation of both Devil Summoner and Persona. Speaking of which, this game was also the first game Kasura Hashino worked on and would be responsible for creating the Guardian system which would also be the precursor to how Personas will work. As for the reception of the game, it was largely okay, with most reviewers citing their enjoyment for the music, story, and the Guardian system, though to a certain extent. However, they criticized certain level design choices and the lack of philosophical aspects within the story. Just like the past two games, this one would be fan translated by Aeon Genesis. However, it wouldn't come out until 2018 due to issues with the game itself. Hell, there's also a PS1 version of this game, yet it didn't get a GBA port like SMT1 or SMT2. Hmm, I wonder why. But we do have a shorter game on our hands, with it not taking too long to beat this time. So, let's go ahead and check out the last mainline game on this Super Famicom. The little if in SMT if isn't just there for a cool name to call this game. Nah, we're in an alternate universe in which the events of SMT1 didn't happen. The US didn't come over to stop demons, Goto was arrested for attempting a coup d'etat, and overall there is no nuclear annihilation, and we don't have to kill our friends this time. Yay! The game begins with you being able to create your own character, and this actually would be the first Megaten game to allow you to play as a girl. And fun fact about that, she is canon in the Persona games that shows up for P1 and the P2 duology. Now after picking your character and deciding their stats, we meet Hazuma, a tormented student who's proclaiming himself as the Demon Emperor. Afterwards we wake up and it's the end of the day and everything looks nice, when the sky suddenly turns dark and all hell breaks loose. Demons have basically invaded the school and there is no way of escaping. From here we have a choice of three characters we can choose to accompany us to stop Hazuma. The first character you meet is Yumi, she's down to earth and compared to the other two characters we meet is rather normal. Joining with her involves us having to save the school and stop Hazuma, which is pretty cut and dry for the most part. The second character you meet is Charlie. He's a self-centered yet witty dude who looks similar to Billy Joe Armstrong and just be grabbing his nuts like he's Michael Jackson or some shit. Joining him involves simply trying to get the hell out of the school with zero fucks given to the school or the other students. And finally, we have our last character, Reiko, who while a little similar to Yumi is also the most mysterious, with us not initially knowing a lot about her. Joining up with her involves us not only saving the school, but trying to save Hazuma as well. Now, depending on who you choose to join up with will result in a different ending. If you team up with Yumi, Hazuma is defeated and the school is sent back to the human world. If you team up with Charlie, you guys have to fight Hazuma, but he ends up letting you go as you two aren't detrimental to his plans, leaving the school and everybody in it in the expanse. And if you team up with Reiko, oh boy, you're in for a treat. After beating Hazuma, we end up going inside his mind for one final battle. While here, we learn a lot more about him, being that his life has never been easy. With his mom leaving the family and taking Reiko, who we find out is Hazuma's little sister, being seen as weird by his classmates and being rejected by everyone he's ever liked. All of this was what end up leading to the overall events of the game. After confronting Hazuma and defeating him once more, Reiko decides to stay with Hazuma and from then on the school is brought back from the expanse, leaving Reiko and Hazuma behind. 
Now, after being the game once with any of these characters, we get the fourth character exclusive to New Game Plus being Akira. Now, Akira is a delinquent with a bad reputation around school, and joining up with him involves taking revenge on Hazma, who not only fucked up his day, but nearly kills him as well. When this happens, Akira gets possessed by the demon Amon, with us having to travel up the Tower of Confinement to stop him. Wait a minute. Akira. Amon. Oh, fuck. After defeating Hazuma, Akira ends up staying in the Expanse due to him not really being human anymore and trans us back to the human world, but ends up leaving the school and everyone in it in the Expanse. Well, fuck it, I guess. The story of If isn't really anything to write home about. If I had to compare the story to anything, it's like the first Digital Devil story. A quick and simple plot, bada bing, bada yam. The characters are cool, though again, nothing absolutely insane. I do like the designs and how the uniforms look, even if it's bold as shit sometimes. And I'm gonna just say this now, I much prefer the original over the PS1 designs. Throughout this retrospect so far, I've mainly enjoyed the PS1 designs a little bit, but here, there's a reason why, because some of them are okay, like Akira looks even more of a badass, and Reiko and Yumi looks pretty cool in their PS1 designs, but what the fuck happened to Charlie, now he looks like an actual devil. And speaking of which, if you hadn't noticed yet, Akira's route as a whole is pretty much a reference to Gun the Guy's Devil Man. And I really wanted to forget about that series, man. God damn it. Other than that, yeah, there really isn't much. Though there is a mobile game that dives further into how Hazma became a demon emperor and plunged the school to the expanse. However, it was released on the Japanese flip phone back in the early 2000s, so right now it isn't really playable. And though, if I remember correctly, there is someone making that possible. Though when looking at the screenshots, it looks pretty cool. So, you know, I wouldn't mind playing this and reviewing it after it becomes playable. So, if the story is short, then that should apply to the gameplay as well, right? To answer that, yes and no. The gameplay from SMT2 has been brought over to IF, and for the most part, it's the same. But there was something weird that I noticed. In SMT2, when your party members were in the back, they could still attack. Yet, here that isn't the case, which is mildly annoying, and for why they designed it like this, I don't even know. Beyond that, the biggest addition to this game is the Guardian system. Whenever you or your partner gets got in a battle, you end up being reincarnated with a new demon as your guardian. This can affect your stats by making you have more health, speed, or it can let you hit harder. And for your partner, they can learn new magic spells on top of the stat changes. Now, on how good the guardians would be depends on the guardian gauge. After every battle, the gauge rises higher and higher, and wherever the bar is when y'all die, determines the strength of the guardian. The higher the bar, the stronger they'll be, and vice versa. If your bar is at zero and or you die multiple times within moments of getting a new guardian, you'll be stuck with this ugly bitch, who only has one useful skill, so yeah, he's as worthless as... You know what? Never mind, I am not going to finish that sentence. But another thing with this game that I wanted to talk about was level scaling, which is weird as fuck in this game. Hell, there's a lot of weird things, but we'll get there eventually. First, let's talk level scaling, which I never really talked about in the past 4 games we reviewed, but with IF it is a glaring issue. I'll try to explain this quickly, but in most RPGs, your level sort of corresponds with where you're at in the game overall. For example, in the beginning of the game, you start at level 1, so within that beginning level, most of the enemies' levels are between 1 to 8, with the highest being maybe 10 or 13. This is a very simple explanation of it, but this concept is in almost every RPG. Now, with SMT IF, the level scaling is weird as by the end of the game, you're going to be at around level 50, while in the past two games, your level is at around 70 to 80. So, you might be asking yourself, hey, what's the problem with that? I'm sure the level scaling is balanced so that the player can have a nice, yet challenging time. Well, the issue is that it makes SMT IF the most grind intensive game yet. And to add to this is the difficulty scaling, from one dungeon to the next being completely out of whack. In one moment, you're dealing with enemies ranging from level 3 to level 12, and in the next dungeon, the level instantly goes up to level 20 to almost as high as level 32. And this keeps on going for every dungeon, by the way. I guarantee that when you experience this, you're going to be screaming every obscene word in the English dictionary. This, combined with other little weird issues in this game, is a gauntlet of pain. And guess what? It only gets worse with the damn dungeons. Overall, there are 7 dungeons in this game, yet depending on the character you choose will determine how many you go through. Yume and Reiko's route involves all 7 dungeons, however Reiko also has an exclusive dungeon at the end with us going inside Hazuma's mine. 
Meanwhile, Charlie only has four dungeons, with the fourth being an exclusive dungeon known as the World of Wrath. And finally, there's Akira, who actually has six dungeons, but those are something else. For this section, I'm mainly going to be talking about Charlie's and Reiko's route. I was going to do Yumi, but both her and Reiko's route are basically the same, and plus, Reiko overall is a much better partner with a better lineup of Guardians. Plus, Charlie's route isn't really talked about as much when discussion of STF is brought up. So of course, what about your boy Akira? Well, at the time of me recording this, I only went halfway through his route before damn near giving up. If I had more time, I would have continued, but considering the amount of grinding I had to do and wanting to get this video out before the end of the month, yeah, that sadly wasn't going to happen. Now, if you want to learn more about Akira's route, then you should watch Marsh's video on it, link down below. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this journey was a pain in the ass, so let's go check out Charlie and Rachel's route, and go and check all the stuff that you guys are going to have to endure. Oh my god! The first place we start at is the school, where we can pick our partners, prepare for the journey ahead, and also find some cool little secrets like this floppy disk, which we'll come back to later. This is also the area where we encounter a reoccurring boss, Osuki. He is a pushover and not worth our time at all, yet it's also a major distraction at many points in the game. After defeating the demon in the gym, we head into our first dungeon, the World of Pride. This dungeon is your standard starter dungeon, with the goal of finding a ring to unlock the corresponding areas in the Chamber of Seals, basically a hub world for each of the game's dungeons. There's not much to really talk about with this area besides being able to get free equipment for our female partner slash characters and an old man explaining the Guardian system. And if you can feel the vibes of this dungeon, it's pretty similar to Mekon City. The boss of this dungeon is also really easy, like we don't have to talk much about him, just use your strongest attacks. Before continuing on though, there's also these geysers, which you're going to fall in love with because these guys can boost you back to the beginning of the dungeons and they're easy to find, usually being a floor below the boss area. Next is the world of Gluttony, where the annoyances begin. Gluttony doesn't have anything completely annoying yet, but introduces tiles that'll spin you right around and pitfalls. But beyond that, it's another simple dungeon where you mainly gotta go up and down, up and down, but also has a second part to it. This second part involves us having to fight Osuki in order to get an item known as Microplasm, which shrinks you and your party down so that you can go inside Orcus's body to face the boss of this dungeon. The boss is a parasite who is pretty easy and looks like a creepy, horny scorpion. I'm sorry if I gave you that image inside your mind. Anyway, he's as easy as the boss in the world of pride and involves the same strategy, so luckily, it isn't too bad. After getting the ring, we now have the world of Sloth, one of the most infamous dungeons in Megaten. And this will be the part where I go, You son of a f***ing I'm going to tear off your and shove them right up your But no, because there's a way to make this dungeon less annoying, and you can thank Filthy Blasphemer for introducing this strat. Link down below to his video on how to get your slot. But to give a TLDR for this strat, before we head to the world of Slav, pick up 9 Fuma Bells from the casino, and if you're curious on what Fuma Bells are, they're items which lower his enemy encounters. Hightail it to the world of Slav, and once you make it to B2, use a Fuma Bell and keep note of the moon phase you used it on. Next, talk to the guard and keep note of when you talk to her, and afterwards turn on the fast forward feature on your emulator and start going up and down. From there you need to use a Fuma Bell before the moon phase you first used it, and then talk to the guard after the moon phase you talked with them. Doing this cuts down the amount of time the students will dig and turn it from a 2 hour affair to only 15 minutes or so, and afterwards you get the ring from there. Plus, there's no bosses here. I repeat, there's no bosses here. Now, before we talk about the other dungeons, there are two cool secrets you can encounter after the world of Sloth. If you go back to Sloth and get the item Mawashi of Concealment and give it to the dude in the Sumo Club, you get a new weapon which is pretty cool and can give enemy status ailments. And finally, remember that little floppy disk from before? Well, when you come back to the school, Cerberus pops out of the disk and after fighting him, he joins your party. And best believe, when I found this out for Rago's Row, I did it ASAP because of the shit that was going to go down later on. Now, after the world of Slav is where things start getting a little tedious. If you have Yumi or Reiko in your party, then after Slav, you head into the world of Envy. But for Charlie, he goes into the last dungeon being the world of Wrath. And for my dos on this dungeon, this annoying ass dungeon is the most bull dungeon in this entire game. And I want to ram my foot up whoever thought this dungeon design was a good idea. If you thought Slav was bad, nah, go to this dungeon as you will hate yourself for every fest quest and meaningless grinding that all doesn't amount to sh and f this megaton or but what the f
I'm sorry, folks, you had to hear all that. Um, I just hate this dungeon a lot. Plus, all the enemies here are mid-level enemies, meaning the final boss is nigh impossible to deal with. More on that later, but let's go back to Rago's route. After Sloth is the world of Envy, which real quick, what the fuck is this dungeon layout? I had the mapper spell and the view sphere on deck for this dungeon, because for whatever reason, there are so much annoying things here that is absolutely ridiculous. This dungeon draws every hazard at you. Moving tiles, dark areas, no comp zones, and pitfalls, which Christ made me want to scream. Plus, I had to write solo for this dungeon, as when this pretty boy came along, Rayco went full simp mode and ran after old dude like fangirls chasing after Harry Styles. But somehow, getting into the boss wasn't exactly annoying. It was tedious, yes, but not overly annoying. And the boss Lilith is also annoying, but if you're prepared for the fight, then she'll be easy. Now, after the battle, you go straight to another battle with Osaki, and considering you may be low health, this boss fight is an absolute nuisance. But if you do heal before encountering him, then again, he's a pushover. Finally, we have the World of Greed, which is a really big dungeon and also has a really cool gimmick to it, which involves the treasure chest and the boss fight. The more treasure you collect from treasure chests, the more powerful the boss becomes, and throughout the entire dungeon, they try to trip you up many times. But the four floors where things get tough, as you can get some of the most powerful armor and weapons from this chest, but doing so will obviously make the boss stronger. Luckily, I had some self-control, surprisingly, and I didn't open up a single chest and was able to just auto-battle the boss. Unfortunately, after beating the boss, you don't get any of the treasure there, and this fucker Osaki steals the final ring from us, so now we gotta fight him. Alright, I hate this man, I hate this man with a fucking passion. And once we get to Osaki... The final fight with Osaki is a little challenging as he pulls all the styles in the effort to kill you, but unfortunately for him, I was grinding my ass off and whooped his ass to Kingdom Come. Goodbye, bitch! With the final ring gathered, we end up heading back to the school for the final dungeon, and uh, ooh yeah, the school is big, and alongside that is basically a gauntlet. There's only one healing spot, and that's it. Plus, the enemies are higher level than you and have some ailment moves that is sure to be a bitch. But once you get through all of that and make it to the 11th floor, now you gotta fight Hazuma himself. Hazuma is strong, and I mean like really strong. He's around level 90, and in contrast, you might be in around level 50, somewhere along those ranges during this fight. Plus, he has a kit that can wipe the floor with you. First of all, he can debuff all your stats. Secondly, he has Mabufu Dine, which will freeze damn near everyone. And finally, his physical attacks hit as hard as a punch from 20 clones of Mike Tyson. And even if you can endure all of that, he also has an instant death spell that can easily kill your whole party. Hazuma is no joke, and if you're playing on Charlie's route, he's damn near impossible to beat. Luckily with Reiko, there is two things that will make the final boss easier. The first thing is an enemy that you can fight known as Angra Mainyu? Okay, never mind, Google. Thank you. Anyway, this demon can give you up to 200,000 XP for beating it, and... But after doing that, we can get to the second thing, getting the Hino Kakatsuchi, the sword that will beat the demon's ass with maximum efficiency. In order to get the sword, you have to go to the World of Envy, and once there, the sword requires you having a really strong guardian, and as long as you have the top 3 strongest guardians for your player character, they'll be able to get it. Now after all that preparation, I was ready to fight Hazuma, and during the battle, I came across a move that made this fight even easier. So if one of your demons die, and Reiko has Hisatis as a guardian, then you can get the skill Nochroma, a spell which brings your demon back to life as basically a zombie, and just like in Final Fantasy, using healing magic on it will kill it instantly. Other than that, this boy can take virtually no damage, and they're able to make the fight a lot easier. After defeating Hazuma, now we have to deal with his mental state, which is a very brief dungeon, though the enemies here are extremely strong, though luckily the encounters are low. Now as for the final final boss, this form of Hazuma is fucking creepy man, and talk about symbolism, this shit is going to be the reason why I can't sleep at night. But yeah, this form is a lot stronger yet it's also similar to Hazuma's last form. As long as you heal up, buff your attacks, and debuff his ass, and use Necroma whenever your party member dies, then this fight is as good as finished. And with that and a long ass sequence of just leaving the dungeon, SMTF is finally done. Ah, this is nice. Oh, come on!
Alright, so let's just do a TLDR for Agrius Route real quick. Agrius Route is really hard, and I mean really hard. If you want to run this route, here's something to know. First of all, all you're going to be doing is grinding your ass off. As Agrius Route is the equivalent of going through Digital Devil Story again, minus the dread of your level being decreased by 1. Second of all, recruit Hothor, Sebek, and Doth by any means necessary. In order to get each of them, you need to speak to Hothor during a new moon, have a strength stat of 13 or more to get Sebek, and have Hothor and Sebek in your party to get Doth. Finally, the boss battles are going to have a mountain of health. So let me stress this again, you need to grind. And plus, you also need to have a good party setup to be able to win, meaning demons with Tarukaja, Rakunda, and other little spells that will make the battles so much easier. And I guarantee you, if you follow these instructions, you'll have an easier time than I did with this route. And whoever the hell keeps on playing this Devilman opener... <laughs> Well, damn. My feelings on Shin Megami Tensei If is weird. On paper, there is a lot of great ideas for this game. Dungeons that reflect the seven deadly sins, the guardian system, and how some of these dungeons have interesting gimmicks like the world of greed. But what killed this game was that it was rushed. As a result, you have a game with good ideas, yet bad execution. Alongside that, there is a lot of examples of artificial difficulty within this game. If you don't know what artificial difficulty is, it's basically a cheap method to make the game harder and also increase the length of the game. And I hate this with a burning passion. Castlevania did this, Mega Man did this, and also Digital Devil Story did this as well. I didn't talk about it in that game because, hey, I was not paying attention. But for this game, oh my god. And yeah, man, for it in particular, the design of this game is what makes it difficult. Enemies with HP that are absolutely insane, back row characters not being able to attack and can only use guns or magic for some reason, and having to grind your ass off to be able to beat the bosses and even enemies. Now, some of these are mainly seen in Akira's route, but it's also sprinkled in Reiko's and Charlie's routes. Now, overall, I like the ideas, but the execution was just plain out horrible. And if they let this game cook more in the oven, then I would have definitely been singing a different tune. So, should you play Shimon Gami Tensei if? To be honest, no, you can definitely skip this one if you want to. Despite being shorter than the other Mega Ten games we've covered so far, this game is capable of giving you chronic depression. And that's sad, because the game had a lot of potential, just needed more time dedicated to improving the gameplay. But if you do decide to play it anyways, then at least bring a map with you. You don't really need a guide for this game, which is honestly surprising, but a map will definitely make progression a lot smoother. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching to the end of the video. First of all, before we go into the next game that we're going to be reviewing, I want to thank you guys so much for showing love to my Shimon Gami Tensei 2 video. I, I really was not expecting that video to do so well so far. And yeah, it's only 52, 53 uh, views right now, but I don't know. For me, that seems like a big win, especially for how most of my videos have gotten close to it to a certain degree. So again, thank you guys so much uh, for showing uh, all that love and stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scrim game dead right now. But the next game we're gonna be doing is the one I'm pretty sure you guys have been waiting for, Nocturne. And I have been getting prepared for this video, getting both copies. I did get this one first, I actually got this one last year, and I got this one recently this year. And I have a funny, interesting story about this, What you guys get to find out when that video visit comes up. Hopefully in two weeks. Or three, I, I honestly don't know. And like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video, and like always, make sure to stay safe, get vaccinated if possible, wear a mask because it's getting kind of crazy out there, and make sure to stay vibing. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs>